Hello everyone, Eric Chappell, Civil Community Evangelist for Autodesk, and I'm here today with Nigel Peters, Software Development Manager uh, in charge of the vehicle tracking um, parts of our technology. Um, <clears throat> welcome to today's webcast. Our, our primary speaker is Nigel today, and he's going to talk to you about parking lot layout using Autodesk vehicle tracking. He'll give you an introduction to that. Before we move on to that, though, I just wanted to uh, introduce you to our webcast series if you are new to it. This is something we try to do twice a month. Uh, we shoot for the first and third Wednesdays of the month, but obviously uh, we weren't able to meet that schedule this week. Sometimes we've got to shift things around, and due to my availability and Nigel's availability, we, uh, we, we thought we'd do a Friday session this week. And it's worked out quite well. We've still got uh, tons of registrants and tons of attendees, so I'm glad to see that. Um, the goal of our community uh, webcast series is to bring you information about our civil product features <clears throat> and and as often as possible we like to bring that to you from the perspective of the product team because you know being users of our software we know that's who you want to hear from the most. Um, we do at times have um, guests from other parts of the company maybe marketing or sales or support. Uh, we may even have guests from outside the company which um, we had a, a I think at our last webcast, which was the um, the Design Slam post game show, where we had a couple of customers come on, and three customers, and tell us about their Design Slam experience at Autodesk University. But for the most part, we uh, we try to get you information from the product team, and that's of course our uh, our setup today. We're going to hear right from Nigel, who is uh, not only part of the product product team, but in charge of a major feature set within the product team. And I can tell you there's no one in the world who knows vehicle tracking better than Nigel. Um, our next webcast, I'm actually going to jump in and do one uh, in, a, in two weeks on Wednesday, April 4th. Uh, I just had the, the, the honor of uh, participating in, Mid, in Midwest University. It's put on by uh, our, our, one of our partners, CTC, and uh, the, the event happened in Minneapolis. And I got to teach, teach this class, in fact, Advanced Road Design with InfraWorks. So I thought I would just go ahead and share it with the world, um, and uh, we're going to we're going to dig into the software and actually build this interchange that you see on your screen right here. And I'll you know show you how it's done, give you some tips and tricks along the way, and uh, we'll get into building some more complex types of configurations with uh, with the road tools in InfraWorks. So I'm looking forward to presenting that. Looking forward to seeing uh, a lot of you on that webcast as well. Watch your email as well as the community site and uh, various forums and social media outlets, and we'll be sending out registration information on that webcast within the next couple of days. Um, we also would love to hear from you about ideas for future, future topics for webcasts, so just go right into the questions panel on your current GoToWebinar interface and type in any ideas you have. Um, if you got any right now, that's fine. If one pops in your mind uh, later on in the presentation, go ahead and throw it in there. Um, at the end of the webcast, I always download all the questions and answers and kind of keep a record of that. And when it's time to plan out future webcasts, I go back to that and see what kinds of things you guys have suggested. So please share with us what you'd like to see. Uh, we'd much rather show you what you want to see than what we think you want to see. So um, it's great information for us. If you haven't become familiar with the Autodesk Civil Engineering Community Center, I highly uh, encourage you to do so. This is a great central hub for all information uh, relating to the civil engineering community as well as uh, Autodesk products. And uh, what's different about this site from, you know, say a blog or, or something like that is this is always current. What's the latest news? What's going on in the forums? What are the latest gallery projects? Everything's, everything's arranged chronologically. Um, what are the latest tips and tricks that have been posted? What is the latest learning material? And uh, it's, a good, it's a good site to bookmark and visit every day. A um, couple times a day if you can because the information up there is always changing and it's always current. So definitely want to check that out. Lots of great resources uh, for you know getting up to speed on the software, getting inspired from other users about the software, learning what's going on with like software updates and new releases. Um, it's all up there, so definitely check it out. You can even search the site, too, if you're looking for something specific. So, you know, if you heard there was a webcast about uh, vehicle tracking parking lot layout and you want to find, find the recording, you can go into the search bar at the top and just type it right in. Um, so definitely, uh, definitely want to get into that.
I don't think we're going to be talking about anything preview or labs or anything today, um, but in the event that we do, just keep in mind that any preview or labs or beta features that, that come into the, into the discussion, that there's no guarantee that those features will exist in the software until you actually see them in a supported version of the software. And please don't make any purchasing decisions based on forward-looking statements or anything we talk about that we're working on but isn't currently in the software. I encourage you to ask lots of questions. Unfortunately, because of the size of our group, uh, we, don't, we can't open the phone lines and have you ask questions uh, uh, through the audio, but you do have a questions panel and I encourage you to use that. And um, I'll be keeping an eye on questions and I'll uh, interrupt Nigel where it's appropriate. And then uh, we're, we're more than likely going to have some time at the end where Nigel can dig into some of your questions there as well. So please don't hold back, ask lots of questions and uh, that'll make uh, Nigel's presentation even more interesting than it's uh, already going to be. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Nigel. Nigel, I will make you presenter, and you can now share your screen. Have me a second while I pick the right monitor to share. Okay. And I'm seeing a cover slide that says Introduction to Parking Lot Layout. Okay, so Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Thank you for a good introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Nigel Peters. I am the product owner for vehicle tracking, and I'm based in the UK. Apologies if I use UK terms. Uh, we call things slightly differently, and I am trying to break the habit of calling pavement sidewalks, but occasionally I do slip up and use the English term for things. So please bear with me on that. So today I want to talk about using vehicle tracking to design a parking lot. With vehicle tracking, you get about 12 commands relating to parking lot layout. So this is a set of the product. It's not related to the roundabout or the sweat paths, though they do know about each other and can interact. You can park vehicles from the sweat path analysis into parking rows. Today I'm concentrating on the commands and how and we define and create standards for parking lot layouts. The tool is very easy to use. It's basically placing a, park, a parking lot in a few minutes by drawing lines and either side of the line or on one side is a row of parking bays. So, in vehicle tracking and in, park, in, in, in actual life, a parking lot is made up of rows of bays, sometimes called stalls, but I'm going to use the term bay for each parking location. A row can have bays on both or, e or either side. So if in the middle of a parking lot, it's quite common that you'll have bays on both sides of the center line, but around the edge, you might only have bays on one side. Where you have bays on both sides of the defining row, you can also have a footpath down the middle. So it's quite common to have that in large shopping mall car parks where you have a footpath running down the middle. We can also define how the bays are aligned. So if you have bays on one side that are a different size in width to the bays on the other side of the row, if you align them so you can drive straight the way through, you waste a lot of space. The, this module allows you to define how the bays are aligned. We also allow for reporting purposes to assign a group for a bay, a zone for a bay. So you can group all the bays that you want into a given zone. And then when we do reporting, you, the reports are based on zone, the type of bay, the number of bays in it, the vehicle access, etc. A common use for zoning is if you have a parking lot that is shared between businesses. You might want to zone visitor car parking and then main car park areas for different sections of the business. The tool is there and its, la its end analysis is to give you counts of bays. Okay, with the product, we ship parking standards for 16 countries from around the world. 
all the standards we ship were created using the tool. They're just saved in a dedicated directory. And if there's a file in that directory, when the software starts up, it will load those files. As I said, we ship for 16 countries. And periodically, we add more countries to the list, or we add newer versions of the parking standards for those countries. Part, the guidelines or standards are a little bit different to the vehicle tracking standards used to define roundabouts and vehicles. With the parking standards, they are technically guidelines. The planning authorities say that parking bays should be within this range, or they should have a minimum width, but they don't specify a maximum width. So the way we've got around this guideline use is we decided to allow you at any time to edit the standard. So if you place a, bay, a, a row of parking bays using a standard, you can then go into the pool, open that parking bay standard, and edit and change any of the features. You can add new bay classifications. You can add new bays. You can change the way the bays are drawn. The, but it's basically any then any parking row or bay that uses the modification will get updated when you save the data. So it's very flexible, very easy to change stuff, very easy to reconfigure the standard to produce something that a customer of yours needs or a special requirement. Uh, so if you want to use the tool to lay out uh, delivery truck bays, very easy to do. We don't ship a standard for delivery trucks, but you can just go and edit it and create it. Uh, so someone's asked, we do ship some metric and, and US unit standards. Most of the standards are in a single unit that we ship with the product. But again, with the parking standards in the US, when I last looked at it from memory, there was very little difference in the guidelines that they were specifying for bays between metric and imperial. It's just rounding of the number slightly. So if you have to stick within exact figures, again, very easy to edit them. OK, so the standard has defines and then calculates the size of bays. There's quite a lot of, there are five things that can actually affect the overall size of bays and the spacing. Each bay, we define a vehicle, or, and that vehicle has a rectangular size, so it's width and length. You can then optionally define safety regions around the bay. You can define the service level of expected use of the bay, how often a vehicle is coming in and out of the bay. The angle of the bays, so the, we force you to define valid angles from zero degrees to 90 degrees for the bays. It has, that allows consistent laying out and ease of use. It is very rare that you can ever have free format angles on bays. And I don't know of any standard that defines that. They're all usually 30 degree, 45 degree, 90 degree, etc fixed angles. And the final thing that will affect the size of a bay and how many bays you can have and how close they are is if you are laying them around a curved curb, that curb radius will affect the spacing of the bays to allow for the rectangular size of the vehicle to, to be fully enclosed in the bay. Right, so as I was saying just a minute ago, we, when you're defining the standard or editing the standard, you can define a range of bays. And in this particular standard here, I'm allowing parallel to the row, parallel to the curb, so zero degree angle bays, 30, 45, 60, and 90 degree. If you want to use some of the ways of interlocking bays and saving space when they're at an angle, you must define in the standard a 45 degree. Otherwise, you can't use the interlocking or herringbone 
style layout for bays. The, the, one of the advantages of having bays at an angle is if you have them at say 30 degrees or 60 degrees, because of the maneuverability of vehicles coming in, the access road or the aisle which vehicles travel down al along the side of the bays can be narrower because you don't need a car to turn 90 degrees into the bay and reverse out and turn 90 degrees to get out again. So it's very quite, even though the bays take more space when they're at an angle, in order to enclose the rectangle of the shape of the vehicle, you can actually get more bays into a parking lot by having them at an angle. And it's also more pleasing to look at by the eye. The design is much nicer. Vehicle sizes. So in this particular standard, we've only got a standard vehicle size, but this is the box for which the vehicle parks in. So the bay markings will run at the edge of this box. And the common use for this is you quite typically will have small, small car, large car, vans, uh, sports utility vehicles, buses, trucks, etc. And you'll define the standard sizes for those sort of types of vehicles. And once you've got those, stand, those sizes in, in the standard, it can be used to, to calculate the overall size of the bay needed to generate it. The final influencing factor in the standard that controls the size of bays and the size of space you need is the service type. So when you have a low frequency use bay, so something like an office where people arrive, park, do their day's work and then leave, you can have narrower roads because it doesn't really matter if they take an extra minute or so to maneuver their vehicle into the parking bay. But where you have high frequency, so a, a drop-off point or a 15-minute minimum par maximum parking bay, it's much more convenient to have wider roads. That allows for more cars to maneuver in and out of the bays and for the maneuvers to be a lot quicker. So based on the service type and level, you can create any number of these and you can specify the one-way road width, the one-way access road width to act if you're cutting an access across the bays, and again the two-way to allow different widths and roads, and the footpath width. So if you're placing a footpath down the middle of the bays, it might it's quite often nice if you know that this, this is getting close to the mall or the store or the office to make the bays have a wider footpath. And this, this sort of is allowed to be defined here. And all of these will have effect on the calculated bay dimension, length, and width. So once you've defined the service types and the angles and the vehicle sizes, you can, you, the code will calculate default values. So these are the calculated values that would be needed to contain the vehicle, but we allow full edit, they're fully editable. You can go and change those quite freely. And if you don't, if you don't like the default being 4.81 and you want to round it up to 4.9, you can just go and type it and edit it and change it. Again, once you make that change, any bays in the existing drawing using this standard will get updated to reflect the new size. Are there any questions on bay sizes and sizing? So someone's asked if there a way to network customized standards. So you can save any standard in the pool. The pool is the collection of standards used in the current drawing. It can be saved to a file. And vehicle tracking allows you to set, specify a network path of a folder to which it will search for any for standard files. This applies to roundabout standards, vehicle standards, and parking standards. What actually happens is you specify that folder is the standards will be copied down to a local cache. And if the network drive is no longer available, 
your standards will still be on your hard drive until you next connect to the network. So it works very well for if you are using vehicle tracking on a laptop and going out to site or customer presentations. You can have corporate standards and those standards can be locked from editing except with parking standards which can be locked for editing until they're used in the next drawing. Okay, so when you're drawing a parking bay, it can have a lot of styles. So there are several ways we can draw parking bays. So you might want a mother and child or a parent and child, a accessibility bay. You might want to have safety zones around the bay. You might want to have bay numbering, uh, parking meters, uh, uh, safety posts, privacy posts, wheel stops. So in order to be able to cater for as maximum styles as possible, we allowed you to create any number of styles and each style you can give a name, you can specify the bay marking, the safety zone around it, the symbol to drawn in the middle, whether or not it's got text, and a whole load of other parameters. So I'll basically go through each of these, but you, once you've created the subsections, you can then decide how and when they're displayed by creating a style that uses a combination that you want. So the first thing, we allow full flexibility on bay markings. So you can have a T marking on either side of the bay or, a, or basically a line with no T on the end. You can have an entrance line and a line at the curb. Each of these can be defined by its own color and, and line weight. You can define whether or not you want the bay hatched. You can define how this, the T markings work when you've got two adjacent bays <coughs> with a safety region. It's a very flexible system for marking the side of the bays and it works very well. The next area is if you're defining accessible or wheelchair access or parent and child bays, you need extra width or, or extra space around the bay. Again, that can be done on either side of the bay and out towards the road side of the bay. Again, that safety zone can be given a size. It can be left unmarked. You can mark it. You can hatch it. You can set it up so it shares two adjacent bays, share the same safety zone, or each bay has its own exact sized safety bay. Bay symbols. You can define, we, we ship with some hard-coded predefined symbols that can be drawn in the bay. Uh, they are for things like motorbikes, uh, for the mother and child or parent and child and the wheelchair symbol. Unfortunately, you can't modify those. Those are hard coded. But you can define your own custom text. And again, these are drawn in whatever color you want and whatever line weight and line style you want. Bank curb furniture, we allow you to define wheel stops, privacy posts within the bay area and safety post and parking meters on the footpath if the row has a central footpath. Again, the, the meters can optionally be shared between two bays or on opposite sides of the footpath. All the furniture is drawn in 2D on the parking bay or the area around it. Finally, bay numbering. We allow you to define the height and width of the number whether or not you want to use Roman numerals, which can be quite useful for if it's a small sim, uh, visitor bay or small area, and how the bays are numbered, or whether or not this bay doesn't have any numbering and the numbering should be ignored. And you have a choice of placing the number at the curb end or at the entrance for the driver. Finally, traffic islands at the end of the row we define 
traffic islands. So there are two types of traffic islands, one at each end of the row, which has full control over the angle and the way it joins and the curb angles and the radii used to separate the traffic island from the last bay on each side and the road that's passing it on the other side. And finally, we have internal islands, which are slightly more restrictive, but these occur whenever you have a uh, end of vertex down the center line of the parking row. Again, with the internal islands, there's not much control, but you do have the option to calculate them, but not draw them. So if you want to do something more fancy, it's quite easy to get the software just to calculate the island and not draw it. So is there any questions on these settings? Why does the template detail block plot not match other industry products? Not sure what the question is. I are uh, referring to we do have something called construction lines, so all the construction lines by default won't be plotted if you use uh, paper space. Only the actual lay, uh, bay markings and symbols and furniture will appear in paper space. There is a setting in vehicle tracking to switch on construction lines if you need to see them in paper space. Uh, yes, there. Uh, I'm aware of the limitation of uh, line by layer and line style by layer. Uh, it's not there yet, Adam, and I'm not sure when it will be in the product. It is on the wish list, though. Okay, so that was basically the end of the talk through on the the vast majority of the standard and writing standards and what it does. I'm just going to do a fairly simple demo of using the product. I'm going to draw some freehand parking lots, parking rows, and show you the sort of functionality we've got. I'm then going to do a parking row along the side of a road, so some parking spaces along the side of the road. And then I'm going to use a fairly crude, fairly simple parking lot layout and just you show the ability to create parallel rows and how quickly it is and how relatively easy it is to use. And then finally, I'm going to show you the reports of bays and bay counts in the system. If there's anything else anyone wants me to demo in this demo, please let me know. Right. Okay, so the tools are here and we have a series, as I said, 16 country standards and I'm just going to use the British one because it's the one I was playing around with this morning. And I'm going to do a row of parking lots based on this standard. So when you start placing the row, you have a non-modal dialog box which allows you to change some of the settings. But basically, you are just pointing and clicking, and you end up with a row. So practically all the functionality on these three commands to add a vertex, extend the row, and extend parallel is all done by grips. So if you want to add a new section at the beginning, you pick up the plus grip. If you want to extend the current selection, you pick up the arrow grip. If you want to break a row in the middle, you pick up the grip to break a row in the middle. If you want to make it a curved row, you pick up a grip, the grip. So it's as simple as editing a p-line to create the central controlling line down the middle. Again, we have th this blue line here 
is showing the needed space for the access road to, on the top half of this. If it's a single lane, if you make it a single lane road, this line can get slightly smaller depending on the standard. If you change the angle of the bays, it will change all the bays along the row. So there is one limitation. A row, the side of each row must have the same angle for all the bays along the row, even if it goes around corners. You can get round that by creating single smaller rows. Okay, so if I zoom in a little bit, we support herringbone. No. Nope. Serves me right for not being for being zoomed out. So here we've because we've got 45 degree bays allowed in our standard, we can support these interlocked or herringbone type bays so that this is quite an efficient way of doing parking lots and one of the advantages is it stops drivers driving straight the way through. Again, we can edit that row, so we've got the ability to edit the row, which brings up the properties again, and I can change the style, he says. Okay, so you, you can change the style of any row quite easily. Sorry, I hit OK and not apply before hitting OK. OK just shuts down the dialog box. You can decide you don't want the islands at the end. Again, the extra space will be used by the bays. If you want, you have the option to project do a parallel row to the existing row. It won't let you snap so that it overlaps. It makes sure that the road is the right width. When you finish placing it, you have this red circle which decides which side of the line I picked has the bays. And again, you have the option to have them on both sides, single side or the other. The bays aren't linked. Even though I made that parallel, I will point out that I can quite happily move this bay, they're not, they're not, they are independent, not directly dynamically linked. Okay, so, so I will sh quickly, in answer to the question about is it possible to create rows using a path command, a bit like the right, you can't lay down more than one row at a time but you can select any p-line or alignment as your parallel object and place the rows all the way along it. So here I've just placed along the curb line of the road a long line of rows and if I set them to, to be parallel to the row I've now got parking bays all the way along the side of the road. So it's very quick, very easy to place parking bays along the edge of a road. Again, if I want to cut that, if there's an access road needed here, I can place an access road by freehand drawing the access road. And I'm going to say this is a two-way road and the alignment's the center line. And now it's just put, cut a hole through the row, produce two rows, they're both independent, but it's allowed enough space between the two rows for the access road based on the width of the access road I defined in the command. At the moment there's no master, there's no linking, no, no updating of the rows. We're aware of that limitation. 
Any other questions before I carry on? No, if you need to have wheel stops, what you need to do is, if I go to, actually I can probably do it this, let's place a row, uh, if I place a new row here, if I then modify the row, sorry, if I, if I go into the pool, edit the standard, go to base styles, and tick wheel stop, I've now got wheel stops on the bays. Equally, I could have added a new style with a bay with wheel stop and set the row to use that standard style. This, these particular wheel stops are shared between alternate bays. Again, they can be independent per bay, one wheel stop per bay, or in this case, it's shared by default because that's what this standard defines. So the final feature you can do on editing a row is if you've got a row, I'm not sure what this standard allows me to put a footpath on, so I'll try. So I footpath. So I've got the option to have the islands having the footpath. So I'll do start island, I'll switch off the footpath. The end island has a footpath. So there's no footpath here. There is a footpath there, and there's a footpath going through the end island. So finally, if I want then to edit this particular row, I can change the style of the bays, select the bay, define which standard I want, disabled, uh, I, I, they're still called disabled bays in the UK, and I'm picked to British standard, they would normally be called access, accessible bay, and that's made the, the bay disabled. Select the next bay I want to change, single dis disabled. You just go along and add the bays as you want. You can, you can decide if you want to have the full, so if I go to the next one and decide I don't want the wheels, uh, I can go and create myself a new unnamed standard, default, uh, no symbol, but with the accessible, and this one I want to have parking meters, and we'll stop. Now I've got the bay number, and I've got the parking meter on the curb. And the, so it's fairly flexible. You, can, you have to go and define a style to change most things, but creating a style is easy to do, and it's in the locations where you need it. Okay, so the final thing I wanted to do is here is the outline of an area I'd like to make into a parking lot. And I'm going to use the parallel parking lot tool just to put bays into here. So if I do new parallel row, I just want to use the defaults at the moment. didn't collect the right object, new parallel row, close the defaults, select that this, do a zero offset, and again this bay, I left it with the last setting, so I've met all the bays are using my new style, I can very easily go and change that to from standard, to standard style, so that goes back to where it was. So here I've got bays all the way around the parking lot there with wheel stops as was defined when I changed it earlier. And now I can very easily do a parallel row and infill. Second parallel row. 
an infill and then I might want to do a manually drawn row in the middle and I don't really want this many disabled or accessible bays so go and change some of them from being accessible to use the standard so that's it a very quick layout of a parking lot filling an area we don't have a flood fill but we do have this ability to do offsets and do it very quickly and once you've done that you can do a report and the parking report tells me that in this drawing I have 771 uh, parking bays they are all in area one and they're based on this design standard and they're broken down into the standard my unnamed standard is the majority of them which I didn't class as a disabled standard when I created it so they're not being counted as disabled or access accessible bays but that gives a very clear indication of how quick and easy it is to do and then you can export this standard into an XML into a CSV file for importing into uh, Excel or some similar spreadsheet are there any questions on this so there's a query about autofill parking bays to maximize the bay count uh, it's not planned in this product uh, it has been demoed in the sandbox builds of Infoworks, but at the moment we have no planned release dates. Any other questions? Nigel, I see that, a few I, more in there, uh, one about how could we add intermediate islands for landscape purposes? Okay, so the only way of doing that at the moment is to create a base style with no label, no markings and put it in or put text in it saying it's landscaping we're aware of the limitation that we're missing landscaping islands and we're also fully aware that in countries in particular Germany requires them the, there is one other cheat you can do it, it really is a cheat uh, if you do a new parking row place the row to a very small vertex and then place the row again you end up with an intermediate island it's at the moment it is not possible in the product to require a percentage of bays it has been requested several times and the, we were thinking about doing it by letting you pick the start bay of the disabled region or zone or accessible region and to fill that. Nigel, the, another question I saw that I was, I was personally interested in is, is there a way to extract features out of the parking stalls like curb edges and stuff maybe to become brake lines for grading purposes? Not at the moment. Uh, we have looked into producing civil 3d feature lines this product currently doesn't know about civil 3d objects other than to use them for the input source for defining the center line so you can do an offset parking road to an alignment to a feature line but we don't produce feature lines as output and currently it is only 2d Yes, you can define the line width of the striping and you can explode and then project onto 2D if you want to explode. I also saw a question about um, is this software separate from AutoCAD Civil 3D? The answer is yes. Yes, um, it is in vehicle tracking. So it requires a vehicle tracking license and it can be used in AutoCAD Civil 3D and for that matter Bentley MicroStation 
And if I'm not mistaken, Nigel, the the way to get vehicle tracking now is to get the AEC collection, correct? Yes. And yes. it's not offered as a separate product anymore, only as, as the AEC collection. So if you have the AEC collection, you have a license to use this. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you explode it, yes, you do lose you do lose the rows completely. Another question I had, Nigel, and you may have covered this or mentioned it, but it might be useful to to just demonstrate it quickly. Um, I know from my experience in designing, um, you know, I, I I did a lot of designing in Pennsylvania where we've got not only counties but they're broken up into townships. Different townships have different requirements for parking stalls. So how you know, let's say you had some weird um, stall width like nine and a half feet that you needed to meet how hard is it to go in and, and adjust a standard or create a new standard that that has you know a custom stall width or length or something like that so let's go to the one in the pool I use the one in the pool edit go to bay dimensions go to vehicle class new Uh, uh, let's say it's I'm gonna make it very horrible 10 meters I'm working I'm in feet so you said nine and a half Eric yeah something nine and a half feet nine and a half feet by 12 And there are the calculated widths for the for the depths for the angles. I might want to make that thirteen point and a half, and I might want to round this one up to. And I might feel that that's a bit too big, so I might want to round it down. So there's your new bay, mm -hmm. and if I go and create a new parking row. Uh, of bay width and you could also apply that standard to something you've already drawn right yes yes so you can edit the standard and apply it to everything in the drawing you can save that standard by right clicking on it so if you right click if if you I strongly recommend not calling it pool when you do this so Uh, so if you rename the pool and then you do save parking standard as file and you can give it a name okay so that can be stored on a network drive in a library somewhere and then the and rest of the then, company can get to it yes you can copy that to a network drive and then you can anyone who is mapped to the same shared drive will get a copy downloaded to their machine and it will be maintained on their machine so yes so you can share that around and you can share it in projects as well so it sounds like you can set it up to where vehicle tracking points to like a standards folder and it would automatically automatically populate when you save that standard yes. oh cool I can't remember where the setting is I think it's in So it's the shared folder here. Gotcha. Just map yourself to a net. If it's mapped to a network drive or wherever it is, what actually happens is it scans that folder every time vehicle tracking starts, and it goes and downloads the the particular libraries in that folder and makes sure you've got the latest copy of that library. And again, with the auto load function, you can decide which of the standards you want to load when you start up the parking tool or any of the vehicle tracking modules so if you don't want anything other than US standards if you untick the ones you don't want and apply the next time you run because they're now already in memory but the next time you run you'll have a reduced list when you run does it load the latest version of the standards file whenever you open vehicle tracking uh, for the ones we ship it loads the ones we ship with the product 
for the version that the, is in the shared folder, it will always load the latest version. That's great, because that means from a CAD manager perspective, you could make, you, if you needed to make an adjustment to a standard, you could just go up to the server and do it, and that would, that would propagate to everyone, right? Yes. That's awesome. And the, the other thing as a CAD manager, you can apply a simple password mm. to prevent your users changing your standards that you ship. Of course, once they've used it and it's in the pool, they can edit what's in the pool, but they're not editing the master standard. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? I saw one come in about, um, can you do vehicle paths on a parking lot? So, I'm curious if there's any integration or interaction between right, so paths. And my that. default vehicle is a stupid vehicle. It's a truck, but they know how to park in parking bays. Hmm. So, if, you, if the cursor hovers over a parking bay, it will place the vehicle in the parking bay. So, I apologize for using a large vehicle. I was doing a demo yesterday, and this was the vehicle I used yesterday. But as you see, as I go over it, it, it explicitly locks into the parking bay until I move out the parking bay. So we don't we support forward compatibility of all vehicle tracking standards and data. So if you edit it, if you have a five-year-old standard it will always load, but we don't support older versions loading newer standards. Can you do a folder? Uh, you can, in the parking standards, create standard groups. So we have an unnamed group here, and I can put the standards in the group. So I did a copy, uh, the US standard, so you can have as many standard groups as you want. You can also use the standard groups to put a note there. It's good practice when you're creating standards to specify the source documents and where it came from in the notes and any assumptions you made. Quite a few of the international source documents do not define all the values that are applicable to defining standards. So therefore, you quite often need to make an assumption. Or, in the case where I showed you just a few seconds ago, I rounded up some of the dimensions of Eric's unusual width parking bay. It would be good to make that, put that in the notes for the standards to say, you rounded these up so engineers who come later can find what you did and why you made the assumptions or changes. Nigel, I see another one about it. Can you can you use a custom block for your accessible spaces? No, uh, it, it's a common requirement, and uh, it's on the wish list. And in my view, it's probably the most important wish list item because that would solve a getting the uh, symbols to be more localized. B, it would solve the decorative planting bay issue because you could declare a block containing your planting layout and you could then place those in unnumbered unmarked bays and that would solve that decorative island issue very quickly so I'm aware of it and it's on the wish list for that matter can you customize the striping in the you know in the striped areas the striping is uses a line type and they're single lines, so they're drawn using a line type with line scale and line width. Mm -hmm. You can spe customize the color. You can't change how long the lines are, but you can define how close they end here, how big the T is at the top, whether or not the T is just an L shape, whether or not you've got a line at the bottom, whether or not you've got a line at the top and how it's hatched. I was thinking more of the, the striped islands. The striped islands, you're limited to, you can have them hatched or not hatched. Okay. But you can define the shape of the island to match your existing row conditions, and the two, two angles are independent of each other, unless you opt to link them together 
and edit them. And you can define all the radii of the curb with one exception, which is that radii there. Mm. The internal radii can't be defined, the external one can. What's the best place for people to go? Uh, are there tutorials and the help, um, you know, for them to get going with, um, other than today's webcast, of course, but is there something they can reference to learn about all the features and settings and what they do? I don't know if Autodesk has published any learning content for this. There's certainly uh, help, other, uh, other, help content, Other than what's though, right? in the help. There is help. It's, the, it's fully documented in the help. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, is that all you uh, wanted to cover today, Nigel? That was all I wanted to cover. I would like to thank everyone for spending an hour and spending an hour listening. And apologize for my use of British English. I'm English, possibly European, but we're leaving. <laughs> so thank you all for your time. Yeah, and before, uh, before we let you go, I just wanted to remind everyone of our next webcast, um, Advanced Road Design with InfraWorks. I'll be building an interchange, as you see there, and talking about some tips and tricks along the way. And uh, that'll be on in two weeks, on Wednesday, April 4th, from 12 to 1 Eastern. Same, uh, I was going to say same time, but it's actually a different day. It's a Wednesday instead of a Friday. And uh, you all have to come because... My feelings will be hurt if, uh, if I don't have a big turnout for my, for my webcast. So uh, make sure you put that on your calendars and watch for the registration link to come out soon in your email as well as on those other, uh, other um, discussion forums and uh, social media channels. As Nigel said, thanks, thanks a bunch for giving us an hour out of your day. Uh, I know I personally found this very informative. I uh, had a lot of questions myself, so I'm, I'm hoping that... Uh, that the rest of you learn some good information. As, as we discussed, definitely check out the help for uh, vehicle tracking to uh, you know, get all the details on all the features and settings and what you can do. And um, check out the discussion boards as well if you're looking for information. And if you've got questions, please post them. We've got a great, very active, very supportive user community that um, they're always willing to help out. So uh, definitely use that resource. I look forward to seeing you at our next webcast and uh, have a great weekend and a great week to follow. Thanks again, Nigel. Thanks.